Hi there, I'm Tom Spencer. This week on Central Texas Gardener, fill your vase with locally grown flowers. Author Deborah Prinzig explains why slow flowers and the 50 mile bouquet join the slow food movement. On tour, visit Rita Anders at her flower farm, where people, not machines, grow and market locally. Daphne Richards answers your top question and makes her pick of the week. And John has your backyard basic tips. So let's get growing right here, right now. Support for Central Texas Gardener comes from GeoGrowers, offering custom soil blends for lawns, gardens, xeriscaping, and organic landscaping supplies. More information at geogrowers.net. Buying local food has become a priority for many of us, but what about cut flowers? Let's head out to Weimar for a fresh look at flowers grown and marketed by hand, not by machines. Have you ever missed the perfect moment to pick a flower? The stage you want to pick it at is just a little bit older than this, but it, it's not shedding. You don't want to pick it here. See how it just sheds off of here? We didn't pick it last week because we need a bunch of this for a wedding this week, but we'll just spray this with hairspray and it'll stop it from shedding. Rita Anders knows the tricks for cut flowers, starting at ground level. From her Cuts of Color farm in Weimar, Texas, she and her assistants package up bundles of joy for the market, weddings, and every special occasion. My grandmother was a big flower grower. She always had a beautiful garden, her and my grandpa, and I love growing flowers, so I said, well, heck, I'm gonna check this out. Rita used to grow tomatoes year-round in greenhouses, starting with one inherited from her grandpa down the road. Even though she still supplies food and herbs to restaurants like Underbelly in Houston, she switched crops in 2004. She'd seen the growing demand for locally grown flowers that arrive at their destination soon after cutting. Take for example, this couple weeks ago I did a wedding and all of my flowers were in there with some roses. Guess what died first? The roses. They all went first. Everything else looked beautiful, the roses were dead. To fill her customers' orders year-round, Rita grows in the greenhouses and the fields. We seed them in there, and then when they're about that tall, we bring them on out and start transplanting them out here. A lot of people direct seed their sunflowers, and we actually are doing some this year too, but normally we transplant everything we grow. We grow it in the greenhouse, and when it's ready, we put it out here. And that's, that's one way we get a jump on everything too. We're seeding constantly, probably every month, we do like major crops like the zinnias and uh, the filler items, but we do sunflowers every week, like 1,500 every week. And then we do buy in a lot of plugs too. For a lot of our fall stuff that started in the fall, we get in plugs. It's all about timing, especially for warm weather plants that go into the fields in spring. But overnight, nature can throw a spin into carefully laid plans. We lost a bed and a half of zinnias that we thought were okay. We planted them out like March 10th and thought they'd be great because usually March 15th, and I looked at the weather forecast, we weren't supposed to get a freeze, but we did. Even the greenhouses aren't immune. When a tornado came through, Rita met the challenge the way her family always has. My grandpa was a farmer, my dad was a farmer. I'm a farmer, my son's a landscaper. It's in our blood, I guess. But you have so much freedom to do what you want to do, plant what you want to plant, sell to who do you want to sell to. It's just, it's freedom. Nobody's telling you what to do. And yes, there's stress, but it's only the stress I create on myself when I try to do too much. She does get help, currently from Caitlin Herzig and Amy Taylor. She's known their husbands since they were babies. In late April, they were cutting larkspurs for Central Market, along with wedding flowers for Rita's niece, Bridget, who's like her second daughter. Rita planted the bride's choice of colors, as she'll do for any bride. Bridget's worked on the farm, too, since she was old enough to put stickers on tomatoes. Some plants that can grow outside in winter get greenhouse protection to keep them bouquet perfect, with netting to keep them straight. Otherwise, they go down on the ground, um, and then we usually can't use them because they go curvy, and they're really hard to work into bouquets. Other plants that start in the greenhouse move outside in spring under shade protection. Sun lovers go to the fields. When the soil has warmed up, Rita also directly seeds summer annuals, a thousand at a time. She rigged up a way to save her back. Pretend this row is empty, but I put the pipe down on the ground and I drop the seed in and it lays on top of the ground and I'll do all the seeds out first on one row and then I come back and I just take this 
empty broom handle stick and I just punch it, barely punch it in the ground and cover it up a little bit. Rita companion plants for bouquets in every season. These are early cheer daffodils. Uh, we planted these like three years ago and we harvest off of them in February, March and then we let them die back and we go ahead and wait till they're done, browned out, and we mow them over and I mulch the bed and I come back and plant celosia plants on top of them. And we grow celosia till the winter time, till it freezes, and then we pull off the celosia, clean it up, and then the early cheer come back and we have another crop. We grow lilies uh, about 25 to a crate and we start picking them when they get to be like this, when these two, two of the buds are colored up. We go ahead and cut the lilies off and then what we do is we let them grow out for a little while to build the bulb for next year and then when they're, the bulb's done growing we turn around and we go ahead and plant salad greens on top of them and we keep harvesting salad greens till like now because now the lilies are starting to come back from last year so we'll get through harvesting the salad greens and let the lilies grow on back. Patrons at Houston's Underbelly restaurant tuck into Rita's freshly harvested food every week. Dill and fennel work for recipes and bouquet fillers. Another easy grower is Bupleurum. Artichoke leaves make dramatic fillers. Scented geraniums are full of fragrance, too. Status is a traditional favorite. Succulents are really, really big in the uh, wedding work this year. Uh, these are tablescapes we're doing for a little wedding and we're doing them in little uh, galvanized tins and they have drainage at the bottom and so do the little wooden boxes that are just made out of some really, really old wood for some houses. She keeps your tablecloth in mind. You can tell how old a sunflower is by the rings of pollen inside. This one here, are hardly any little florets of pollen have opened up, whereas this one here, there's several around that little circle. We cut into very clean buckets. We wash all our buckets with chlorine, make sure everything's really clean. We cut into fresh water. What's her advice for customers once they get them home? And any vase you put your flowers in, it has to be very, very clean. You put flowers in a dirty vase and you're killing them. I always tell them to recut them just a little bit and I give them a packet of flower food. And I don't tell them that they don't have to use it all at one time, like half and then like two or three days, pour the water out, reclip them and put the rest of the food in there with fresh water. And uh, the people that do that, the flowers last. I'm the world's worst. I just put them in the vase and leave them. <laughs> What about arranging your own cut flowers? I used to go in ones, threes, fives. I never do two of anything. Like, you're not gonna put two sunflowers in a bouquet. You're either gonna put one or you're gonna put three or five. Uh, odd numbers and then textures and uh, variety. Just try to get different colors, different. In, but then again, monochrome is in two, but you can do different flowers in the same color. So it's just, it's what you like. There's really not a right and a wrong. And if you take beautiful stuff and put it together, it's gonna to be beautiful. Along with growing specialty orders and making arrangements for weddings and other events, Rita sells directly from the farm, but prefers a call in advance. They're usually there on Wednesdays, cutting and packaging flowers to deliver to Central Markets in Houston on Thursday morning. Many flowers like poppies can be cut and kept in the cooler for a few days, unlike basil that can't be refrigerated. It turns black. Yeah, it's just like when you're growing it out in the garden, once you start getting 40 degree temperatures, it doesn't like it. And we don't put our zinnias in the cooler either. We hand package everything here, but in the big wholesale places, everything's done pretty much by machine. Along with supporting the local economy and its families, Rita's satisfying a hunger for simply fresh beauty. Her long lasting impact starts right at home. This Rita, she does everything handmade, and um, my sophomore year, I took a floral design class, and so I got to learn all the aspects of what she does, and um, I have to say that learning about it um, makes us appreciate her job so much more because it is so tedious, and she does a fantastic job. With that wonderful story of Rita's flowers grown and marketed by hand right here in Texas, now let's take a look at the growing nationwide sensitivity about cut flowers. We're joined by Deborah Prinzig, an author who's written a beautiful book about this whole phenomenon called the 50 Mile Bouquet, and her new book, Slow Flowers, Four Seasons of Locally Grown Bouquets. And she's, we're also joined by Rita Anders, who's of 
Cuts of Color from Weimar, Texas, who is actually one of these local growers who's providing us with magical and beautiful flowers in our own backyard. So it's great to have you here. Thanks. Uh, Thanks. Deborah, I want to start with you. Talk, let's talk about this phenomenon. Uh, there's a growing recognition that there's a kind of a dark side to the floral industry and uh, local and sustainable practices are coming back uh, to the floral industry, largely thanks to folks like Rita. But uh, you've been a champion of this, so thank you for that. Absolutely. I feel like flower farmers are the new rock stars in the floral world. And uh, the I think what's behind it is very much a parallel with the slow food industry. Exactly. We want to know the food we're eating. Chefs have popularized their vendors, um, mm -hmm. the purveyors. And that storytelling really draws us in and makes us appreciate the work of growing food. Well, mm -hmm. similarly, uh, it's happening again in the domestic flower industry and it's really exciting when we can make that connection with who's growing our flowers. Yeah, it's a it's a way of reweaving community really, you know, of both the, the food growers and the, the flower vendors as well because you're supporting your neighbors. Absolutely, you know. absolutely. And it's just uh, so generic when we're buying flowers in a plastic sleeve at a supermarket and we have no idea, they're not even in season and we don't know where they came from. and. Um, we what lose, might be on them? Right, <laughs> that was and the thing that concerns me. How they were treated, and we just have a little bit of a um, a disconnect. Whereas when we know the farmer and we can meet the farmer face to face, mm -hmm. or we hear their stories, uh, we're supporting an American, you know, farming industry. Exactly. Now you met Rita at a actually a conference, right? Yes, there's a great association, Association of Specialty Cut Flower Growers, and okay. they're farmers in every state. And they're really experts in their own regional mm -hmm. uniqueness of, of what grows when and where. And so we met at a conference and um, I got to come visit her farm. Okay, and Rita, uh, uh, Cuts of Color, again in Weimar, Texas, out uh, near LaGrange. And uh, how did you get involved in growing flowers? I'm curious. Um, I pretty much inherited the love of flowers from my grandparents. Mm -hmm. And I uh, just kept going in from there. And uh, I used to raise vegetables and uh, I wanted to do something more fun. And right. I still raise vegetables, but I love growing flowers and I love making people happy. Yeah. I, I love people calling, say, hey, make this arrangement for so and so. I want to brighten her day. And that's the ones I really love. And then I do love taking flowers into Houston to my market and uh, selling them there and just hearing the stories of happy people. Yeah. Well, that's <laughs> that's part of the magic of it all, isn't it? Yes. It, it, well, I can see it really lights you up, which is awesome. And, uh, you know, you made this transition from growing produce to flowers and found it to be really rewarding and successful, huh? Yes, but I still do produce, too. Okay. Okay. Uh, so you, you're covering all the bases. I, yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's great. So I want to learn more about, uh, uh, you know, kind of the book and, and, and some of the stories behind it. Now, I'm particularly curious about your, uh, the new book. In this, you've created a bouquet of locally grown flowers every week for a year. Right. And just to show people that this is possible and you can cr have this one wonderful diversity, right? Right. And, Tom, what happened was I was working on the 50-mile bouquet and I was doing lots of floral arranging with this great, you know, product mm. that I bring home from farms. And it was November, and I, there was a lot of pushback, like, well, yeah, you can do local and seasonal if you live in Southern California, uh, but you can't do that in Seattle, where I live, because what do we have? Twigs and conifers in the winter. Mm -hmm. I thought, no, let me see. Let me see what I can do every week. And I used uh, really an unusual ingredients from my own garden and from friends. Mm -hmm. And then I started buying what the farmers had, and the growers who I've gotten to know, like Rita, they they always have some secret little thing they're trying and they'll say, well, check out this cool foliage, Deborah, or this unusual bulb. And I was thrilled to see that you mm -hmm. can have a bouquet year round and have it be seasonal and local. Right, and I think the, the consumers are more and more aware that these choices matter. Absolutely, and the wedding market is really pushing the return to local because brides become so involved in their selection of their colors and the, the seasons and the flowers that maybe remind them of grandmother or whatever. And these are flowers that can't be shipped from uh, two continents away. They're more delicate and ephemeral and they need that loving care, you know, of a local grower mm -hmm. who's going to just grow them with attention, like gourmet, you know, couture detail. Yeah. So It's different when you're selling to somebody you know. Yes. As opposed to just shipping them off to market. Yes. 
And I think that's part of the reward, obviously, for you. The you biggest said. reward is the brides that I do. When they come in, and they, either I deliver their flowers or they come pick them up and take them out to their wedding uh, site. And the, the look in their faces, you know, it just, just warms your heart that mm. they're so happy to get those flowers. And then you get all the comments, and it's just like, yes, that was worth it. <laughs> all those hard work. <laughs> that's wonderful. That's mm -hmm. wonderful. And I can, I, you know, what, I, uh, what I'm enjoying so much is just your passion for this, because it, it's, it's evident. And I can see where your customers probably love that as well. Now, you know, beyond uh, just the economy of this and the personal joy, there are other reasons why we should be growing flowers. Uh, and there, there, ben there are benefits just to having flower gardens. Uh, do you Absolutely. go into that in your books at all? Well, yeah, the whole idea of the 50-mile bouquet is kind of a play on the 100-mile diet, which mm -hmm. we've heard about in the food world. But really, it's uh, looking at uh, the fact that flowers are perishable, they're also maybe, some people consider luxury goods. I don't necessarily, we were talking about the that. The bees don't, and That's they need right. them. <laughs> so, right, if you, if you go so far on the pendulum to edibles, mm -hmm. then you don't have nectar sources for right. your pollinators. Right. So that's an argument for keeping flowers in your garden. The argument for keeping it local is really that it's good for the planet and you're not using jet fuel to you know, have flowers flown to you or truck fuel to have them you right. know, driven to you. Um, it's possible to have a five-step bouquet even in your own backyard where you're just have a little cutting garden, Sure. Um, even in pots. Uh, you had nasturtium today. I thought that would be the easiest thing to grow in pots. Use them for bouquets and for mm -hmm. cooking. Right, right. So, you know, again, great benefit to the gardener as well as to the, to the, to the planet, really, in a sense of, of growing all these things. And the, the joy of it, uh, the healing kind of quality of having a garden. Uh, uh, now, doing all of this really changes the relationship that people have with flowers yes. in a way. And, yes. that, and something I, I know that you want to explore a little bit. Well, I think there is sort of a spiritual quality to uh, being close to your garden. And when we observe uh, what we're growing, we stop and think about it. And we maybe have a greater appreciation than something that's, you know, just generic, as I said, a generic bunch of flowers. Um, and for some people, the uh, beauty of bringing them indoors and sharing them on their dining table or giving them as gifts, it's, it's, an, a it's an ancient, timeless mm -hmm. uh, practice. And so we're just kind of reclaiming it. All right. And, and it, the arrangement is an ancient and beautiful practice as well, a, a genuine art form. And I can tell that you delight in that. So that it's <laughs> particularly uh, joyful for me to, to be with you on that. But we have come to the end of, of our time. But thank you both so much for being our guest Thanks, on Central Tom. Texas thank Gardener. You. Yes. Best wishes in your endeavors. Thank you. And coming up next, it's our friend Daphne. I'm Daphne Richards and this is Augie. This week's question is another one that we get all the time. Why do leaves turn yellow and fall off of otherwise healthy looking plants? This is one of those questions that's not easy to answer since there are so many possible reasons for this symptom. When I get this question I always feel like a doctor who can't give you a definitive answer for why you have a persistent cough. You don't have a cold, you don't have the flu, so it might be allergies, it might be your sinuses, it might be any number of things, so you'll just have to wait, out, wait it out until the symptoms pass. I always feel frustrated by this response when I visit the doctor, until I remember that often I have the same answer for people with plant questions. Sometimes it's just impossible to pin down a specific reason for particular symptoms. In the case of yellowing leaves, it might be that the plant is getting too much water, or it might be just that the leaf is old. It could also be that the plant is lacking in nutrients, so the plant decides to sacrifice a leaf and no longer wastes precious resources trying to keep it alive. If a leaf is not green, it's lacking in chlorophyll and unable to do its job, which is to perform photosynthesis and supply the plant with carbohydrates for growth. The remedy for this instance would be to fertilize the plant. But if the plant is getting too much water, obviously the solution is to cut back on watering. You can tell if the plant needs water by pressing your finger down into the soil as far as you can. That's about two inches, and you don't need to water if the soil's not dry at that depth. If the top two inches never dry out, the soil below that definitely doesn't. To confuse you even more, another reason for healthy plants to develop yellowing leaves and drop them might be not enough water. So the key to solving water issues is going to be watching the soil and checking the moisture level quite often for a while. It would be a good idea to purchase a moisture meter. 
You can find very affordable ones at most nurseries, and there's really no need to buy an expensive one. The good news is that overall yellowing of older leaves is not a sign of a disease and is rarely a sign of insect issues. So my best advice is to remove the yellow leaves and just pay close attention to your plant's growing environment. As with that persistent cough, this symptom will usually run its course with very little effort on your part. Our plant this week is Phlox paniculata, cultivar John Fanick. You might see this plant listed as deciduous, but I've found that it performs better when treated as a perennial meaning that you'll shear it to the ground, forcing it to produce all new growth from the roots. Phlox will look fuller and healthier and have more flowers if you do. John Fanick Phlox should be planted in a shady spot that receives bright but indirect sunlight. As with most shade-loving plants, it does need a little extra water, but don't overwater it, which will cause it to rot. In my garden, Phlox will often develop new leaves that have intravenal chlorosis, yellow leaves that still have green veins. That's because it prefers soil that's slightly more acidic than ours here in Central Texas. This problem is easily remedied by using a fertilizer with a little iron in it. Fertilizer products that are designed for acid-loving plants will clear up the problem in no time. We have another great viewer photo this week from Kathy, who uses Trisha's recipes for fertilizer teas on her container plants with fabulous results. Nice balcony, Kathy. Out in your garden, if you have fruit trees that have become overgrown in the center, Prune out some of those branches so that the rest will be healthier. We'd love to hear from you, so please visit us at klru.org ctg with your questions and plants of the week from your garden. Thanks, Daphne. Now let's check in with Backyard Basics. Hello, gardening friends. Welcome to Backyard Basics. You may have planted some flowers in the spring, and if you didn't, it's a good time to put some in for the fall. And I like to talk about... Um, butterflies and pretty flowers, these kinds of things. You know, cosmos is great in the summertime. It gets rather large, it blooms like crazy, and um, it's a wonderful flower also. Periwinkles, yep, these little red ones, and there's white ones, there's many different types. Um, they do very well in the heat. They need a good, well-draining soil. They don't like to have their feet wet. And so um, marigolds, another companion plant for tomatoes, but you can put them in containers also. And um, I like to buy them when they're really tight. You need to see a little bit of the color. Usually it's on the tags, but when they're tight like that, they bloom longer. I think you get much more time out of them when you just start out with them tight, like any flower just about. And so um, good in pots and good in beds also. The, um, the other plants that I like to put out there uh, would be um, zinnias. Zinnias are wonderful. They come in these little yellow ones that are nice border plants. Some of the pink ones, great color. And then there's some taller ones also for um, cut flowers. Nothing better than cut flowers in the summertime and in the fall. God, these guys look really great in the fall. Perennials could be going in too. This is a good time to put some perennials into the garden. And some of them attract butterflies, like the four nerve daisy. They visit this one along their route back home or going north, either one. And then the other one, a great one for attracting butterflies to the garden, would be the lantanas. Now the four nerve daisy and the lantana don't have to have a real rich soil. They like the native soils in many of these areas. So um, I would consider those. And if you want the lantanas to continue blooming, go ahead and deadhead them. Take those flowers off of there once they're forming seeds. And um, I think that you'll see that they continue to bloom over and over um, throughout the season. Now the white mist flower over here, that's an excellent one for the fall butterflies that are migrating through our area. It, it just gets full of color. It's a beautiful plant, and I think you would enjoy that one, especially when these little jewels come flying through in the fall. They're gonna visit your yard a lot more than they used to. And so um, this is a good one. You know, all of these plants, some of them like a better soil, and others, like these natives, um, don't have to have such a rich soil. They're growing very easily in the poorer soils. I think maybe they need a little bit of an amendment when they get started, but not necessarily um, a rich garden soil, especially the four nerve daisy. Now, I'd like to um, put in some uh, seedlings also. You can start seeds, that's very easy. Um, one of the things I like to germinate them in is a uh, mix that may have earthworm castings in it. Matter of fact, it should have some earthworm castings in there. And then um, the seeds would be going in directly. And some of these trays have 
a lot of places to put seeds in. So you can put a wide variety of the different seeds and then there you go. This is a good way to start some of these flowers because many of these are not available in the nurseries. And so there are some that you might like and you may as well just start them yourself. It's very easy. Sometimes when you direct seed in the garden, the pill bugs will be doing a lot of damage. And so it'll be easier to get these others started, keep them nice and sturdy, keep them evenly moist in the beginning. They really need that for the germination and then they're on their way. I like to put a little bit of rock phosphate in the hole. It makes a lot of difference. And then I will use the uh, liquid seaweed sprays also as a drench or as a spray, this is very helpful in those really hot months of the summertime. When August is coming around, that seaweed spray will make all the difference in the world. So, soaking them in when you transplant, or go ahead and do them as a foliar, you're gonna see that uh, this is one of the best ways to ensure that crop of yours, to make sure that they get off with a good start, and don't forget to mulch them too. Mulching makes a great difference when you're using these different plants in the garden. So. For Backyard Basics, I'm John Dromgul. I'll see you later in the summer. Find out more at klru.org slash ctg and join us on Facebook. Next week, get ready for fall vegetables. Until then, I'll see you in the garden. To learn about today's program, watch online and follow CTG's blog, check out klru.org slash ctg. Support for Central Texas Gardener comes from GeoGrowers, offering custom soil blends for lawns, gardens, xeriscaping, and organic landscaping supplies. More information at geogrowers.net.